when you look at other people and you see some people who seem to have it all together and are successful, what do you feel? Do you ever feel envy of others' successes or does that lead you to be depressed about what you feel are your own lacks and, and anxieties? Pastor Mike Novotny has some words of encouragement to help you rejoice at others and in yourself. What's my part in the body of Christ? I'm not sure if that's a feeling you ever wrestle with, but uh, I know I do. And I think most often that question comes into my heart when I walk into a room and other people are there who are, are better than me. Now, how many of you have siblings here today? I mean, you're not older, only kids. Yeah, sometimes that happens when you have an older brother or sister who's like the stereotypical firstborn child. You know what I'm talking about? They're organized and they're responsible normally and they're, they're smart and they're disciplined. And maybe you were the second born kid and you just never could keep up. Huh? Or maybe it was the opposite. Maybe you were the firstborn kid and you were responsible and disciplined and smart, but the secondborn kid in your family just enjoyed life way more. Maybe your little brother, your little sister was just more laid back, uh, a free spirit. They had fun and people loved being around them. They just had that personality that could light up a room and that was never you. Or maybe you wrestled with that same dynamic at work. There's someone you really like at work and you're friends and you get along, but that person just had talents and strengths that the, the management noticed that you just didn't have. Or maybe that feeling happened in a place like this, in a church. You know, there's people out in the lobby who feel so comfortable meeting strangers and they crack jokes and they win people over and you've always felt, I don't know, anxious, uncomfortable in crowds meeting new people. So what do you say to your heart when, when that happens? When someone's smarter, better, stronger, more faithful, more knowledgeable, what, would, what do you tell yourself? Well, well, this part of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, would remind you that you're a part in the body of Christ. You're a special creation of God. And, and that's easy to say, but not all parts are created equal, are they? I mean, the armpit is a part of the body, but it's not exactly like anyone's raising their hand saying, hey, I'd really like to be that. Or the appendix is a part of the body, but if it left and was taken out, it's not like the body suffers. And sometimes that's not enough for our hearts to hear, well, you're a part, yeah, you're, you're one of us, that's fine, but it doesn't always make you feel like you belong. So what, what do you do then? Well, the Apostle Paul today wants to answer that question for us. You know, there are four parts in the Bible that talk about these different parts, these different gifts and different strengths, and Paul wrote three of them. And in the longest section, 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul actually devotes an entire paragraph trying to help people who feel insecure about their faith. People who feel like they don't belong, people who battle with envy and, and jealousy and feeling like they, they're not good enough. And so I'm going to direct your attention to the screen, or if you're about a Bible with you, to 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul's going to help us tackle all those things and so much more. So Paul says this in verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Which is a brilliant analogy. <laughs> right? So Paul's tapping into this, this feeling in his friends' hearts that, that they didn't belong. You know, they went to church and they saw these different parts, these different people, and it just felt like they didn't measure up. And, and so he makes this comparison. He talks about feet compared to hands, and then he talks about ears compared to eyes. And those are two great illustrations, and, and here's why. Because if there was a comparison for the most popular kid at the part high school, the feet wouldn't stand a chance against the hands. And think of how it is. I mean, we, we greet with our hands, we say goodbye with our hands, there's a whole language with our hands. If it's hands versus feet, the feet don't stand a chance, right? And the same thing is true with Paul's other analogy, the ears compared to the eyes. I mean, th think of how many beautiful songs have been written about people's eyes, right? You're my brown-eyed girl or hazel eyes. Some of you have blue eyes, so you, like, seriously, your whole wardrobe is based on the color of your eyes. Uh, some of you women, you, you just have, you spend absurd amounts of time with eyeliner and eyeshadow and mascara because you're trying to draw more attention to your eyes, but the ears... 
<laughs> Seriously, like, what's up with earlobes? <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. I don't know what their purpose is and what they do for the body, but ears have, they have this weird shape and these weird folds. There's hair that grows in random places out of our um, I was in Mexico a couple years ago, and a guy said to me, Miguel, Mike, tienes orejas peludas, which means you have hairy ears. <laughs> And I said, I do? <laughs> and I looked in the mirror, and there was these like, random wispy hair. So about every month, I have to take my razor and shave my earlobes. Is, is that also too much information? It's weird. <laughs> the ears, but the eyes are, are so much better. Uh, I mean, ladies, if you went on a date, and you came home, and you're with your girlfriends, and you're texting them, you say, we're at dinner, and I just got lost in his eyes, the girls would say, aw. <laughs> but if you said, oh, we're at dinner, and I just got lost in his ears, <laughs> They'd say, ew, like, what? Are you okay? Do you need to call anyone? Eyes versus ears, it, you know, it just doesn't stand a chance. And we laugh about these things. But Paul, you know, he's not talking about body parts here. He's talking about people. People who feel like, if you put me next to this person, who would choose me? Compared to what that person does, they're like a hand and I'm like a foot. They deserve to be presented and I deserve to be hidden. They deserve to be drawn attention to, but, but not me. Some of us just battle that insecurity and, and that jealousy. So what do you do? And I was thinking about all of you the other day as I got ready for this message, and I was wondering, like, which of you battle this? Well, what kind of people in the church would be like the feet and the ears people? And what kind of people would be like the hands and the eyes people? Who might be more prone to envy and jealousy and insecurity. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch of factors to answer that question, but, but there are two things that popped out at me, and I'd love for you to write them down. I, I think the two triggers for, for jealousy that we have to be really, really cautious of um, are on our next slide. The, the two triggers would be when other people have the stage and then when other people have certain strengths. I think you have to be very, very careful with your heart and your soul when someone else is on the stage and when someone else has certain strengths. Uh, here's what I mean by that. In any church, in any family, in any group of people, there are some people who have what I'm going to call the stage. They have more visible positions while other people are behind the scenes. For example, right now you can see me talking, but why can you see me talking? Well, because I chose to stand up here in front of you, and number two, someone chose to turn on these, right? Uh, the lights. But you might know my name. Do you know the person who's running the lights today? Now you, you see me, but you, you don't see them. Or maybe you're listening to this message on a podcast and you hear Pastor Mike's voice, but who uploaded the podcast and who recorded it and who made sure there were batteries in the microphone so that it would work? You, you get what I'm saying? You know, all these people are, are, are part of the ministry, but you only get to see some of them and not others. Same thing in a band, right? Some people are, are going to sing and they're going to be right in front and other people are going to be hidden back on, on different instruments. Some people are going to mix sounds. Some people are going to arrange music. Some people are going to pick the songs. But you're only going to see a couple people when you come to church, even though dozens of people were part of the process. And when you're not the one who's on stage, uh, it's hard to resist the, the envy. And I think here's why. It's not that everyone wants to be a public speaker. Right? Most of us are terrified of public speaking. Not all of us want to be a lead singer in the, in the church band. I, I think what happens is people who are on stage tend to get more attention, more encouragement, and more compliments. Right? I mean, if you really loved the music today, w would you research and find the person who actually picked the songs for today's service? Well, no. What do even think about that? Who would you go to? The musicians. And you give them the encouragement and all the people who are part of the process would go unrecognized. Or maybe you're part of the, the church ministry and you do something behind the scenes and it's not that you want to be praised and get some special award but no one knows who you are and so no one can say thank you or we appreciate you and encourage you. It feels like you're doing the work and no one sees it. And so those moments when someone else is getting the attention, the encouragement, the award, the, the praise, you have to be very careful of your heart. And number two, you also have to watch your heart when certain people have different strengths. Now, here at our church, uh, we are huge proponents of a personality test called the Strengths Finder. Uh, I know some of you have heard of it. Many of you have taken the test. And I was just emailing with a, a pastor friend this week, and he was talking about his Strengths Finder, and he said, you know, I didn't get any of the good ones. 
<laughs> he said, I didn't get any of the manly ones, is what he said. And I remember feeling that way the first time I took it. Like I read the different strengths and I was thinking, I hope I get that one. And I hope I have that one. And oh, that's really impressive. And this one, yeah. Uh, are you familiar? With the, there's a strength uh, in the list of 34 uh, different strengths finders called WU. Uh, it stands for winning others over. Uh, it's those people who have the kind of personality that they can meet a stranger and they feel so comfortable they will win them over in less than two minutes. Waitresses don't stand a chance. Guests who sit next to these people at church are about to love this place. They're going to make such a good impression and the words come so quickly and they make people laugh and feel so comfortable. It's like an incredible, incredible gift. Or there's another gift called communication where words come really easily to you where you can give speeches and presentations at work, where you can communicate in a relationship, where, where it's not difficult. Your, your mind just thinks of words really quickly and what, what a great gift that is. There's another strength called command, which is like this leadership gift where when you have an idea, people follow you. Uh, you might be riffing it with the other people about, you know, where's the church going to go and we all share ideas and no one really gets on board. But when command people share an idea, it's like people follow. And they're really, really impressive gifts. But you look at some of the other gifts on the list and honestly, they, they just don't look that impressive. Uh, there's one strength called intellection, which the authors of Strengths Finder say, it's when you just have that kind of personality where you need to retreat and have quiet time to think. It's like people drain your energy, your resources, and you just need a book and you need to get away from the crowds. And it kind of seems like a, a flaw, doesn't it? Like, okay, well, once you're back to full strength, the rest of us would like to get on with the ministry and, and the family plans. Uh, there's another strength called relator, which are people who do not generally do well in big crowds. They're not great at small talk. Instead, they just have this small group of friends that they're really faithful to. And it seems like, oh, okay, you're, you're kind of awkward meeting new people. That's wonderful. Good, good for you for that strength, right? And and, and so there's these differences and it feels like if I have these, wow, well, those are the impressive people at church. And if I have this, it feels like, like I'm an ear, like I'm a foot. Do I belong? You put both those things together. And if you come to a gathering of Christians and, and you don't get attention and you don't get praise and you don't get encouragement and you don't have those gifts that everyone notices, it's so easy to feel insecure. Or maybe that's not just a problem for some of us. Maybe that's a struggle for lots of us. Uh, there's this Bible study that meets at my house on a lot of Thursday nights. And uh, one of our values is to keep what happens in the room in the room. It's confidential. But uh, I asked my group and they said I could share this story with you. Uh, a few months ago, we were talking about jealousy. Uh, we're in the book of Genesis and studying the, this guy named Jacob who always wanted more. And he was always jealous and envious of what other people had. Uh, even his own brother. And after we got done studying it, I, I asked the group, so who, who are you jealous of? And I was not expecting their answers. A woman A in the group said that she was jealous of couple B for their relationship. And couple B said they were jealous of guy C for his job. And guy C said he was jealous for the talents of woman D. And woman D said she was jealous for the personality of person A. And like we went around the room and it turns out that none of us felt good enough. We thought if I was like you, well, I'd be content. But that person wasn't content. They wanted to be like that person who wanted to have the family situation of that, who wanted to have the history of that person, who wanted to have the strengths of this person, who wanted to have the gifts and talents of that person. And it turned out it didn't, it didn't matter who was on the stage or who was in, in the seats. It didn't matter who had these strengths or who had that strength. Like all of us were battling this envy and this jealousy. And if I could be uh, just real with you today, I can guarantee you that standing here does not fix that part of your heart. Um, I hope this doesn't sound really, really arrogant, but, but I have been super blessed to do some really cool things uh, with my job. I've gotten to travel the world and talk to people about God. I've gotten to travel the country and speak to big groups of pastors. I've gotten to write books. I've gotten to be like the keynote speaker, the headliner at conferences. And do you think all that stuff has made my heart secure? For me, it, it takes one person. 
one person in the room who's better than me. And all that stuff falls apart. So what do we do? So this jealousy doesn't devour Jesus' people. What do we do? Well, tonight Paul has the answer. See, Paul did not want this obsessive comparison disorder to devour his friends. God refused to, to let jealousy amputate a single member of the body of Christ. So he wasn't done in 1 Corinthians 12. He went on to say this. Paul said, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. You catch Paul's logic? He said, hey, if we changed you and made you like them, who would take your place? Who, who would do what you're supposed to do? <laughs> Which makes total sense, right? <laughs> Have you ever pulled a muscle that you didn't know you had until you pulled it? And you realize, oh my goodness, I, I use this all the time to get up and to eat and to laugh and to drink. I never thought about this, but it's such an important part of my body. And, and I guarantee you that's true for our church and it's true for every church. Do you know what's, what's behind this sermon tonight? Tons of people. Did you know there's a whole group of people at our church behind the scenes who pray for every single Sunday? For the music, for the message, for our guests, for the gospel to spread. Did you know, do you know their names? Of course you don't. But if they weren't praying, what would, what would today have been? Do you know when I get a sermon ready, there's a group of people at our church called our sermon research team who I ask questions and I bounce ideas and even though I get to share the message, they're half of the content. Do you know their names? Of course you don't. But every time a sermon gets to your heart, it's because of them. You ever seen those people after church who got the personality and they're meeting new people and they're laughing and making guests feel comfortable? Do you know why our guests are sticking around? Because someone made food. <laughs> Do you know the people who made the food? No, of course you don't. But if it wasn't for them, the people who have these big, impressive gifts wouldn't have a chance to stick around. Do you see how it works? It's all the small parts. It's, it's the backup singers. It's the bass players. It's the person at the soundboard. It's the person that, that knows how to make a camera work, that makes the church work. Paul says, why, why would we change you? We, we need you. What would the body be if we amputated you? If we change your parts? He says, no, it's a good, good thing that there are many parts, but just one body. And if that's not enough to convince you that you belong in this place, Paul's going to say one last thing. Look at verse 18. I skipped over it intentionally. He said, in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there's one thing and only one thing that can deal with jealousy and envy and insecurity in your heart, it's this. To know that God made you. The strengths that you have, these ones and not those, you know why? Because God made you. When God knit you together in your mother's womb, he could have picked anything. But he picked this thing. And God is good at his job. If there's one big idea I want you to take away, it's the antidote for jealousy and it's our big idea if you want to write it in your programs, is that God made me. And if God is God with a capital G, if God is good and he is holy and he makes no mistakes, then jealousy doesn't stand a chance. Actually, this sentence is, is why insecurity is not just a weakness, it's a sin. Because what does my insecurity say about, about God? If you complained about a meal at a restaurant, who are, who are you insulting? The chef who made it. And if you look in the mirror and think you're trash, who are you insulting? The God who made you. So when you say, oh, it's nothing or I'm no good or I'm no one, you're not being humble. That's pride in disguise. That's insulting the God of all the universe who created you. Instead, Jesus would say, embrace this fact that you are a part in the body of Christ. That God did not just, just make you, he saved you and he equipped you to be on this great mission to change the world. I mean, maybe the best thing I could tell you today is you are part of the body of Christ with an emphasis not on the word part, but on the word Christ. You think about that, if you believe in Jesus, no matter how talented or weak you think you are, you are connected to Jesus Christ. Does that blow your mind? 
<laughs> That's just crazy to me. Like Jesus, I think about Jesus' woo, how he could win others over. He could talk to tax collectors and prostitutes and broken people and they would love him because he talked about mercy and grace. And I think about Jesus' command, his leadership. He marched to the cross and he wouldn't let all the enemies and demons in the world stop him. But he wasn't overbearing. Instead, he laid down all of his power and he set his crown down next to a cross so that you could be loved by God. And I think about Jesus' gift of communication. That being tortured and dying on a cross, he still could speak those words that change everything. It's, it's finished. Your shame, your past, your sins, your struggles, your weakness, your jealousy, your everything, it's finished. God took care of it. I think of Jesus' intellection that he would withdraw to lonely places so he could be by himself and pray. And do you know who he was praying for? He, he's praying for you. <laughs> and you're connected to that Jesus. <laughs> because of that Jesus, you are forgiven and you are loved and you are valuable. You are a member of the body of Christ. <laughs> and you know what that means? It means that God will always notice you. If no one says a word because of what you do, God notices you. If no one sees the little things that you do for your family, at your job, or for our church, God sees. So when you're a part of our church family who doesn't park as close as they can to the building, but far, far, far away, not just for the cardio, so that our guests who show up late because they don't even know what time church starts, they can have the best spots. Even if I don't say a word to you, do you know who notices? God. And when you come to church early and, and you can snag one of those coveted like end seats, but you don't. You slide all the way in, even though it's going to be inconvenient if I have to go to the bathroom, I'm going to have to crawl over 10 people, but I'm going to slide in so the person who comes in late to church, they don't have to embarrass themselves and ask me to move. Even if the usher doesn't see you and say a word, you, you know who does? God. And if you change a diaper in Jesus' name, if you give a cup of cold water to a little kid and no one sees, do you know who does? God. And if you pray for church, and if you try to encourage people and you welcome a guest in Jesus' name, even if you never get an award, even if I don't say a thing, do you know who will? God. And one day you will stand before Jesus and he will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Whatever you did for the least of these people, you did for me. <laughs> so tell that to your jealousy, your insecurity, your sin. I'm a member of the body of Christ and my God always sees. <laughs> See, in the end, you in, in God's sight are a lot like this final picture. Anyone know what that is? That's $450.3 million. <laughs> that painting is a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. It was recently discovered and refurbished. It's called Savior of the World, his painting of Jesus Christ. 26 inches by 19 inches and last year it broke a record, the most expensive thing ever sold at an art auction, $450.3 million for paint. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you why in the world. Why would someone pay a half a billion dollars for some paint? A half a billion dollars, why would they part with that for this little picture? I, I can tell you why. Because there's only one of it. And it sounds a lot like someone I'm looking at right now. You know, in your business life, how can you not be competitive, right? Companies that are not competitive in the marketplace go out of business. How can you not be competitive at your job? If you don't bring game, somebody else is going to push you out of the way. So we know we need to bring competition. Here's the thing. Thanks to Pastor Mike's wonderful Bible study, we know that we can do our best and bring our game, but we don't have to resent and fear and envy people who are successful and bring gifts that we don't have. The grace of Jesus given to us enables us to show grace towards other people. And here's the thing, Christians can clap and cheer for other people's gifts and for their successes without getting envious. The thing is just to enjoy ourselves bringing what we do with all our heart and Jesus will take care of the rest. I'll be back in just a minute to pray with you. 
As you head into this new year, you may not know what lies ahead, but by spending time in God's Word each day, you can grow spiritually stronger so you're ready for whatever the year may bring. That's why we want to send you the Growing Stronger Daily Devotional to help you build your faith one day at a time. It's packed with 365 daily devotions full of encouragement for you from our Time of Grace team, including Pastor Jeske and Pastor Mike Novotny. With daily insights from God's Word to bring you closer to Him and His promises for you, this devotional is the perfect resource to help you strengthen your faith every day of the year. And we'd love to send you a copy of Growing Stronger as our thanks for your gift today to help others share the timeless truths of God's Word. So call now to give and request your copy of this book. Call 800-661-3311, visit timeofgrace.org, or text TIME to 313131. I'm glad to have the chance from my heart to say thank you to all of our Grace partners and to all of you who have provided financial support to make Time of Grace's ministries possible. We would be talking to nobody without you. We have no other support than the people who watch our programs and read our materials. I want to say thank you, and I want to invite your prayers so that our outreach can continue and we can bring good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, help us to believe in ourselves the way you do. You believe in us. You gave us gifts. You love us and have forgiven us and you consider us important parts of your body. Help us to enjoy what we bring and to look at the successes and the gifts and talents of other people, not with jealousy or envy, but with genuine appreciation. Help us to find joy in clapping and cheering for other people, for we know that their service and love makes you happy as well. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske celebrating God's amazing grace with you. And it all starts now. I am absolutely thrilled to have a personal opportunity to express my thanks to you and my appreciation to all of you who have chosen to become Grace Partners. Together, you and I are on an amazing adventure through Time of Grace's print materials, through the broadcast of the television program, and through digital distribution through the internet. You and I together touch millions of people each month. Isn't that extraordinary? I want to say thank you. For our monthly donors, we invite you to consider yourself as a partner in spreading good news of God's grace. We call you our Grace Partners. If you have not yet become a Grace Partner, I'd like to invite you today to pray and consider becoming part of the team and joining the Grace Partners. I'd love to have you on the team. It all starts now. Mm, it all starts now. The preceding program was sponsored by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.